All right, it's 12.15. Uh, I'm going to call the ISFMP policy board to order. Uh, this is Pat Kelleher, uh, board chair. And we have a fairly lengthy agenda today, so we're going to try to move through it as, uh, as uh, efficiently as we can. Um, it is noon hour, so uh, if you're uh, just remind, probably a lot of people are going to use this as a working lunch. So just remind yourself to uh, mind your uh, mute button on this uh, great rainy day. It's raining up here too, Spud. So uh, maybe it's, uh, it's it's a long storm here. Um, uh, I want to just first bring your attention to uh, the first uh, item, which is the approval of the agenda. Uh, does anybody uh, have any comments on the agenda? Is any new additions to the agenda? Adam Nowalski. Thank you very much. I was just hoping for a few minutes this afternoon under other business to talk about a couple of issues that came up, uh, came to my attention about the appeals process as chair of the Summer Flanders Cup and Black Sea Bass Board as we work through the New York issue. Great. Thanks, Adam. We'll add that to uh, other business. Is there anybody else? Seeing no other hands. Uh, um, is there any objection to adding that uh, to the existing agenda? Hearing no under no objections, uh, we have consent for the approval of the agenda. Um, moving along to the approval of the proceedings from May 2021. Does anybody have any comments uh, on the minutes from, from that meeting? Seeing no hands, uh, we have consent on the approval. Uh, that brings us to uh, public comment. Uh, I have one person signed up for public comment today on items not on the agenda, and that's Ben Landry. Is there anybody else uh, that has an item uh, that they would like to bring to the policy board that is not on the agenda? I'm not seeing any hands. So with that, Mr. Landry, are you uh, are you on with us? Uh, I'll give you, uh, we, we do have a pretty uh, lengthy agenda today, so I'm going to try to keep you to three minutes if I could, Ben. No, that's fine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members, um, my name is Ben Landry. I represent uh, Omega Protein and Omega Harvesters, um, the Manhattan fishing uh, operation out of Reedville, Virginia. Um, for what it's worth, I mean, you know, you guys have likely heard of Omega Protein, understand the regulatory process that seems to be ever present about this fishery. My comments today are more, you know, to urge the commission to you know, review its public comment process. Um, you know, I've been to these meetings for, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 15, 16 years, and it's increasingly getting a little bit, um, more outrageous in terms of the public comment. You know, this is not an effort to, um, you know, censor anyone's views or uh, to ensure that someone can't share their, their personal thoughts, but, you know, these have to be rooted in fact. And, you know, my company particularly goes extra hard um, to ensure that anything that we say in the public domain is accurate, um, we oftentimes present, uh, present citations, uh, particularly in our written communication to uh, exact statements that we make. And that doesn't appear to be occurring with a number of people that are making public comments. You, you know, opinions are one thing, but they, they have to be rooted in fact. And, you know, the species in particular of Manhattan, I, I do not think is getting that right now in terms of the public comments. You know, for instance, yesterday and for several meetings leading up to it, we've heard um, a couple of gentlemen, particularly from uh, the state of Maryland, you know, constantly repeat overfishing of Menhaden, overfishing of Menhaden in the Bay. You know, the BAM model and the ERP model that this commission is extraordinarily proud of. You guys, you know, recently put out a, a press release explaining the ERP process and how it's a great success. None of those documents indicated that it's overfishing yet. When the public makes those comments, 
it just falls flat. There's no one there to correct it. There's no one there to say, well, listen, actually this species is very healthy and we've taken precautionary measures over a decade to ensure that it's healthy. So I would like to see, you know, the commission look inward, see if there's some policy that could be developed or some committee that can be formed, you know, even if, you know, the individual TC chairman of that specific species um, step up and, and correct some of the more egregious things during the public comment process. I see that I'm running up against my three minutes, but, um, you know, it's a big deal to us, particularly a company like Omega Protein that is always seen under the gun. You know, let's let's kind of clean up this public comment process and make sure that the accurate information is being shared and not this this fake news. So thank you for your time. And um, if there's anything that you guys ever need from Omega Protein, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate those comments. Um, is there anybody else from the public uh, that would like to make a comment today? Not seeing any other hands, so we'll move right along on the agenda. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the update on the Marine Recreational Information Program. Uh, and I believe Richard Cody is presenting. Richard, are you on? Yes, I'm on. Great. Thank you. Yours. All right. Well, I have um, two back-to-back -back presentations here. So uh, if it's okay, Mr. Chair, I'll, at the end of the first one, uh, we can allow time for questions or we can, um, you know, keep them till the end. It's whatever, whatever your, your call is on that one. Yeah, no, no, Richard, I think it's fine. Let's, uh, let's pause at the end of the first presentation, take a few questions and we'll go right into the second one. All right, well, thank you. Um, so the, the title of the talk today is an overview of the methodology uh, used for the 2020 uh, estimation process. And, and basically, as you all know, we had uh, some challenges last year in terms of uh, data collection in, in, in light of COVID. So next slide, please. So I have a, a few points that I wanted to make um, up front and try to guide the, the presentation as I, as I uh, completed. So the main point is that for 2020 catch and effort estimates, uh, in general, um, there were no really, what I would call extreme or unexpected results um, as a result of the, the methodology that we used. Um, 2020 is typically in line with the prior years um, on re our recent trends. So 2018 and 2019 in particular. So the, the impact of the data gaps and imputation um, um, is, was variable, of course, but as you increase the resolution of the estimation or the estimates, um, you know, it, it tended to be more variable. But the, at, the, at the state level and at the regional level, um, were, the impacts were fairly minimal. So what I'll do today is I'll review the data gaps uh, from, from COVID-19 to try and give you a picture of uh, some of the, uh, the challenges to the EMRIP surveys and, and other state-led surveys as well. Um, I'll provide a brief overview of the data imputation and estimation methods. And I don't have um, <clears throat> particularly detailed descriptions of these because basically our methodology for 2020 with the, exception, with the exception of uh, including the imputation process, a simple imputation process, uh, didn't vary that much. We tried to keep it as consistent as we could with previous years, uh, just so that the uh, information would be comparable. And then lastly, I have a, a presentation of the catch and effort estimate, starting out with catch, uh, looking at recent time series, 2018 through 2020, and then um, a comparison of um, estimates with and without uh, imputed records included. And then there's a little uh, piece on next steps. So next slide. So as far as 2020 uh, data gaps are concerned, um, the main impacts were to the access point anger intercept survey. And, and that's the source of our catch rate information, but it's also used uh, to supply some supplemental effort information. So it, it accounts for 
uh, fishing effort uh, made uh, by out-of-state or non-coastal anglers. And it also is how MRIP allocates effort to fishing areas. So it's a state and federal and in inland waters. Um, the, the largest data gaps, or the, the main data gaps, I should say, were primarily uh, focused in wave two, so March and April, although they did extend into May and into later months as well. But the, the main point here is that most uh, states had resumed sampling at some level um, in May or by the end of May. Um, there were a couple uh, of exceptions, Connecticut, New Jersey and Virginia. These states didn't resume until later and that was largely because of um, state mandated uh, safety protocols. Um, head mode, boat mode, um, no state had, had resumed by the end of 2020 uh, their head boat sampling. A couple of attempts were made but uh, social distancing was very difficult to maintain, as you can imagine, on a, on a head boat. And then um, the, the point here is that the APIS sampling uh, for, those, for those head boats occurs at sea uh, as ride along trips or observer trips. And then, um, and this is largely limited to the Mid Atlantic and New England regions. In the Southeast, North Carolina South, um, we have the Southeast Regional Head Boat Survey. Um, Biological sampling by that survey was suspended, but um, samplers were able to continue their validation and quality assurance visits. So just to verify trips made, things like that, but no uh, biological data were collected. So next slide. <clears throat> so these, these are a little busy, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this first slide because the, the next few are basically the same, but refer to uh, lengths and weights information as well. But what, what you have here is a, a heat map of um, uh, assignments or intercepts, so our intercept tallies. And um, what we've done here is we've compared 2020, we'll, we'll call it sampler productivity or the numbers of intercepts uh, with the previous uh, three years, 2017 through 2019. So they're compared to the average of, of those previous three years. So where you have um, a green box, that means that uh, sampling was at a level of 75% or above the average for the previous three years. Um, and then it, it cascades down to zero. So the gray boxes refer an app to an absence of, of sampling. And you'll see at the top, there are the various uh, states included in the different regions. So we have region four, five, six, and seven. Region four being the North Atlantic, uh, region five, the mid, uh, six, South Atlantic, and then seven, the Gulf of Mexico. And I'm gonna focus largely on uh, the Atlantic coast and, and um, I, I won't be providing any catch um, uh, examples from, from the Gulf. So with the main point of this uh, graph that you see that there are weeks and months on the vertical axis and you have a number of different boxes depending on the state. So the boxes really refer to a mode and a region within the state. So um, some states may have more than others. But the main point here is that you can see that most of the gaps occurred earlier in the year um, starting uh, in March where sampling had, had initiated and continuing through you know, August in some states, uh, but largely by August, uh, sampling had resumed and was, appro was approaching levels that we have seen uh, for the previous three years. But you can see for, for April in particular, there was a, almost a complete absence of sampling with just a few states, Rhode Island being one, um, that were able to maintain uh, their sample levels. So next slide. So this is the, um, what we have here are the collection of lengths uh, associated with those intercepts. And one of the main concerns that we had when we were um, evaluating the data throughout the year was the, um, the impact that social distancing might have on um, the collection of, of lengths and weights from fish. Obviously, you have to get close to a fisherman into his cooler or her cooler to, to get the, the weight and lengths of, of the fish that are landed. And we do see um, 
I would say, uh, less weights um, once we resume sampling uh, throughout the, the year than we have in the, in the previous three uh, years. In, in some cases, there are some blocks here where you'll see the uh, gray boxes extend um, to the end of the year, basically. So that's something uh, that did concern us because uh, we do use uh, an imputation process for uh, length and weight information. So next slide. And, and this is just the, uh, the equivalent uh, in, uh, of the weights uh, measurements. So uh, for, for intercepts, uh, generally, samplers will try to get a weight and a length. Um, priority is given to a weight, although that's not always possible depending on the, the amount of time that a, an angler has available. But you can see it's a similar pattern to what you, we've seen with the uh, length information and also with the intercept information. So you see um, some difficulties were um, had and some uh, differences between the states existed in their ability to collect weights through the end of the year. So next slide. So as far as uh, data imputation and estimation is concerned, um, as, you, as you've seen, um, the sampling suspensions and resulting data gaps for the states uh, vary, but they are known. So that does help us identify uh, where the data gaps are. are. And uh, we uh, had a lot of help in doing this and I have to you know, commend uh, the states and state directors. Um, I was able to participate in Mike Pentany's uh, monthly or you know, regular meetings with uh, state directors. And uh, this was uh, very beneficial to us in terms of um, assessing where states were in in their uh, recovery process when it, when it comes to sampling. So I'm grateful for the, the chance to uh, hear from the states at, at, the, at that venue. Um, as I said, um, we used a, a simple imputation approach to fill gaps. So uh, basically what that means is that where gaps were identified, and you saw them in the, the first uh, few slides, um, that's where we uh, included imputed data. And we looked at 2018 and 2019, the two um, most proximate years that were available um, to fill those data gaps. Um, one thing that I will mention is that because we used two years of data, we downweighted each year uh, by a factor of two to take into consideration that we were using uh, two years of data. And we did have input from statistical consultants, uh, Jean Opsomer, Mike Brick, and others on the, um, the reliability or the validity of the approach that we looked at. And um, as far as estimation is concerned, um, standard MRIP methodology, as I said, uh, we continue to use that for both catch and effort estimates. And for 2020, even though we didn't produce um, the wave level estimates during the year, uh, wave level estimates are available uh, at this point, uh, along with the final annual estimates. So next slide. Um, just to give you some context for the decision on uh, imputation, um, we did look at uh, other uh, more complex methods, modeling approaches, uh, et cetera. And um, I mean, the, the decision was made because of the, you know, the urgency with the need for the data that um, this would be a rather resource intensive uh, approach. I mean, we could look into it at a later uh, point, but um, in the interest in getting data out as quickly as possible, and then also in trying to maintain a level of fidelity with our current uh, estimation methods, we you know, went with the, the simpler approach, which we, we felt would be more reproducible and um, less subject to variation. Um, and get us further, or, and get us, um, and keep us basically um, at a level of comparability that we wouldn't have had um, if we had gone the modeling approach. Um, the other thing about uh, looking at more complex methods is that um, they do require some sources of auxiliary information. 
And, you know, part of our decision process there was that during the year we did approach um, the White House Office of Management and Budget um, for uh, PRA um, clearance on uh, modifications to the APHIS uh, questionnaire. Uh, and those were not approved. And we felt that, that since that was our vehicle for obtaining additional information, um, it would be difficult for us to uh, entertain um, standalone surveys in addition to to the um, the MRIP APIS surveys. So we we were forced really to abandon um, you know any modifications to the the APIS questionnaire. Um, and then the last thing I'll, I'll mention here also is that we we do plan to revisit the 2020 estimates. Uh, when uh, complete data are available for 2021. One of the um, suggestions that's been made uh, to us, and I, I think it, 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 it's really a responsibility of ours to, to look at the, the two shouldering years rather than the two um, most recent proximate or previous years uh, to see if there are any differences between um, using 2019 and 2021 versus 2018 and 2019 data. So um, that's something we plan to do once 21, 2021 data become available. And there are still some questions regarding the integrity of the, the 2021 data. Um, you know, we're, we're partway through the year. We haven't had um, what I would call any interruptions of sampling so far, but um, you know, we'll monitor that as the year uh, continues. Next slide. So the, the next few slides, I'm, I'm going to basically categorize them as two different kinds. Uh, the first set will sort of concentrate on 2018 to 2020 uh, time series. So I'll have annual landings by state and region just for a select few species uh, as examples. And then the second set um, will look at 2020 estimates in particular um, with and without uh, imputed records for comparison. And we'll do a similar type of uh, a comparison. So next slide. So I apologize about the, the amount of detail that's in this, uh, in this slide. Obviously, if you're looking at a laptop, this is going to be hard to see. But uh, the take home here is that we have three years of data side by side represented in the, the various bars. And I'll present this for the South Atlantic, Mid-Atlantic, and uh, North Atlantic regions. And um, so basically you have three years of data represented by the blue, uh, sort of red and, and green bars, uh, 2018, 2019, and 2020 uh, data, or estimates. And the 2020 estimates are the imputed estimates. So for for South Atlantic, we have uh, black sea bass, dolphin, gray snapper, gray triggerfish, uh, king mackerel, red drum, Spanish mackerel, and spotted sea trout. And um, you you can see, for the most part, um, there are no real large deviations from um, the previous years. Um, I do highlight one here that's uh, with uh, Spanish mackerel. And if we go to the next slide, I can show you what what we have here is um, a comparison of estimates with and without the imputed data included. So for instance, the blue bars uh, refer to the um, estimates with imputed data included, and then the uh, red bars are the uh, without imputed data. And you can see uh, for the Spanish macro example um, that the, the two um, data, or the two versions, are, are similar. So the, the relative effect of the imputed data on the estimate is, is low. So it wasn't due to uh, the, the imputation uh, methodology in this case that we saw a spike in the uh, Spanish mackerel landings. Um, I can't say with 100% certainty that that would be the case for all uh, comparisons. It would depend on uh, the species, the amount of data that were available and um, the level of sampling that occurred as well. So there are a number of different factors that would come into play. But in general, what you see here is that at this um, regional level, um, we don't see uh, very much in the way of variation uh, 
or differences between imputed and uh, non-imputed estimates um, for which you know the uh, non-imputed estimates are available um, next slide and this is a similar um, uh, set of graphs for New England and Mid-Atlantic for New England I have uh, Atlantic cod uh, mackerel black sea bass bluefish haddock and um, you can see the estimates uh, well hopefully you can see for total landings here um, are fairly similar between the three years in, in most cases um, and then for the mid-atlantic we have uh, atlantic croaker black sea bass and bluefish again and in the case of new york we see um, that uh, for bluefish uh, 2019 uh, is the spike here so when you combine the imputed data for 2018 and 2019 um, and downweight them based on their their um, the fact that there's two years of data being used for imputation um, it doesn't um, at least it's not terribly obvious from the data uh, or from the estimate in 2020 that it uh, had a, an impact uh, um, a you know a, a, a large impact on the estimate so next slide and again this is the same uh, set of species and we're looking at imputed versus uh, non-imputed uh, estimates and you can see you know fairly good uh, agreement between the two um, there are some uh, situations such as uh, Atlantic Croker where there's a quite a bit of a difference between um, the imputed versus the non-imputed uh, estimate. So next slide. So um, we, we recognize that you know, using imputed data is not uh, an ideal situation when it comes to providing um, catch information or advice, uh, at least uh, in terms of uh, predicting or, or um, estimating landings. So um, to give managers uh, at least some tools to, to at least um, evaluate the data based on the contribution of the, um, the imputed data to the overall estimate, what we did for the uh, query tool is we provided for each of the different um, uh, catch components, uh, type A, type B1, type B2, and then uh, harvest versus release catches. Um, we provided um, uh, an evaluation or at least a, a metric for looking at the relative contribution or weighted contribution um, of the imputed data to the overall estimate. So this gives you an idea of um, the amount, we'll say, of uh, um, the contribution to the estimate um, from the imputed data. So for instance, with shore mode in the North Atlantic at the top row there, for shore, we have 38% uh, of the, um, the uh, catch rate information came from imputed data. So that's the way to interpret uh, that information. So we hope that that will at least provide managers and assessors with um, some kind of a, a metric that will allow them to um, assess the, um, the overall contribution of imputed data. And next slide. Next slide is really a similar um, um, slide to the last one, but for uh, black sea bass. And you can see um, for party boat mode, um, obviously there's a, a high amount of uh, imputed data used in that estimate, uh, largely because um, there were very few trips uh, um, being made and then also uh, the amount of information that, that was possible or an absence of APIS uh, information. So um, that would mean that uh, largely the, the estimates would be based on 2018-2019 data. Uh, next slide. So this is a uh, sort of a similar uh, presentation of the effort estimates. And uh, again, we're looking at 2018 through 2020 uh, annual effort by region. 
and then um, annual effort by charter and headboat uh, for charter and headboat moments as, as well broken out. And then the, the second set will be uh, the estimates uh, with or without included records. So next slide. So I've got the, the four different uh, Emirate regions here. You have New England, Mid-Atlantic, South Atlantic, and Gulf of Mexico. And overall, um, the, the annual effort estimates uh, were, were in line with previous years. Um, we didn't see um, the huge reductions that were you know, predicted early on, at least not for the, the private boat and shore modes. And in fact, um, you know, there, there was uh, plenty of uh, anecdotal information that suggested that uh, fishing uh, picked up in certain areas as a way to um, you know, to get outside uh, social and, and do something that where you could socially distance and, and still take advantage of the outdoors. So in, the, in these uh, slides here, we have the imputed uh, estimates. Um, and as I said, the effort survey uh, continued largely uninterrupted uh, throughout the year. Um, for the charter boat mode, we did um, stop conducting uh, telephone calls for a short period, I think once, I think it was New York, uh, shut down uh, the, uh, the sector, uh, but resumed it just to confirm zero trip reporting from the, from the fleet. Um, so in, in this graph here, you can see that in some cases, the Mid-Atlantic and um, the Gulf of Mexico, you had uh, you know, increases in, um, in effort. Um, in 2020 relative to the, the previous years. Next slide. So in, in this slide, we have the broken out for charter and headboat effort. And it's a different picture really for the uh, for higher sector. And if you look at New England, you can see there's a, a fairly marked drop in uh, effort for charter and headboats um, um, from 2019 to 2020. Um, we see a similar trend in the Mid-Atlantic as well, and to a lesser extent in the Gulf of Mexico. But the, um, the trend stayed um, pretty consistent for uh, the South Atlantic, where 2018, or 2019 and 2020 were similar in the level of, of, of headboat or for higher effort. Uh, next slide. So as far as uh, 20... Uh, 20 effort estimates are concerned. Um, in the uh, New England and uh, Mid-Atlantic regions, we did have, as I said, um, uh, domains or estimation domains that, that had uh, zero trips reported. So we were, we were interested in seeing how these might have affected the overall effort estimates um, if we included those in the imputation um, uh, process. And in this case here, you can see the red bar compared to the uh, green bar um, uh, and the blue bar. So you have imputation, you have imputation excluding the zero trips where you don't have um, corresponding uh, catch rate information for, uh, for trips that were zeros, basically. And then you have uh, the full complement of imputed uh, information. And you can see for the Mid-Atlantic and New England where that occurred, um, those values are, are consistent. So there's uh, little or no impact uh, due to the inclusion of zeros. In the South Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico, um, we didn't experience that, um, that data gap to that extent. So you don't see a, a red bar in either of those two uh, regions. Next slide. So as far as next steps are concerned, um, we did release the, um, the estimates in April uh, on schedule for our normal annual um, release. And along with that release, we did also um, include the wave level estimates as well. So those are available on the website right now through the, the query tool and the complete data are, are also available for, for download, including the imputed uh, data as well. Um, we are continuing uh, our communications efforts with the regions to try and keep a, um, 
our finger on the pulse basically of sampling efforts um you know as this has been a, a sort of a, a roller coaster ride for for many people um you know we're trying to keep uh, as uh, up to abreast as much as we can with any changes that might occur in sampling efforts and we're um and with that you know we're continuing to monitor uh, the sampling uh, as we had in in 2020 throughout 2021 um, and the part of the reason for that too is if we if we do revisit or when we do revisit the estimates at the end of uh, 20 or early 2022 and we um, plan to look at the 2021 estimates um, any information that we have that can inform um, the use of those data uh, you know will hopefully uh, help us in evaluating um, whether they provide any uh, benefit uh, relative to the 2018, 2019 uh, imputed estimates. So I think that's the last slide in the uh, estimation process. And I know I kind of threw a lot of data at people and the slides were maybe a little bit hard to, to follow. So um, ahead of asking any questions, um, I, I will offer my, my email is on the, uh, the first slide. So if you need to reach out to me after, this meeting or any time, uh, please do. But um, if it's okay with you, uh, Mr. Chair, um, we could I could take questions now if if you like. Yeah, let's let's do that, Richard. Does anybody any member of the policy board have any questions for Richard on the uh, 2020 catch estimates? Uh, I've got a couple hands up. We're going to go with Jason Magnamy and then Lynn Fagley. Jason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Richard, for that um, really good presentation. Um, I, in particular, I like seeing those comparisons. It's uh, really helpful to kind of uh, see it in that way. Um, two quick, um, I guess I'll call them comments more than questions, if you don't mind. Um, the first is, I think it's important to think ahead a little bit uh, to the use of this data in stock assessments. And the main thing I think um, could use some thought uh, is how to characterize the uncertainty for that year. So you have kind of a standard method to capturing uncertainty in, in the normal survey. And I imagine it's different or it will be different for that year and that may or may not matter, but I think it, it could become um, an important factor as folks are kind of working through um, various stock assessments. And so if um, your team is able to provide some information on what, what you think is best, uh, you know, that would be, I think, helpful to the analytical teams. And then the other quick thing I, I wanted to offer is I really like this idea of kind of revisiting you know you used uh, an imputation method um, that kind of patched you through leaning on the previous two or preceding two years um, I like this idea of now kind of looking okay now we can use a, a year before and a year after um, I think it's good and, and a smart idea to continue to investigate the best process for patching in that 2020 number um, with limits. So I, I think at some point, you know, a year or maybe two years from now, we, we should call it good and, and move on, <laughs> call, you know, so it doesn't get recreated, uh, you know, forever uh, off into the future. So uh, just a couple of comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Oh, go, Richard, if you have a response, feel feel free to jump in. Yeah, I, I will mention that we we are um, you know looking at at any um, you know looking at using a similar approach that we use for uh, twenty twenty and evaluating the twenty twenty one data to look at if there are any uh, it looks like there's a drop in productivity um, because you know it's still. There are still some concerns about the ability of samplers to to do their jobs in safely in the field, and so you know we'll be trying to to look at that throughout the year 
And I think that um, that'll be important, I think, in any consideration of using 2021 as a shoulder year, um, you know, to, to compare with the previous imputation methods. So, Jay, I, I, I do take to heart your, you know, your um, advice there to, you know, look at um, what we have and, and try to um, at, at least provide the context that's needed for, you know, management and assessment to, to treat the data appropriately. Great, thank you, Richard. Um, I had Lynn Figley's hand up, but Lynn is down now. Lynn, did you have a comment? I question? did. I, oh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a quick question. Um, I wonder, uh, Maya, if you could go back to the screen that shows the query, the screenshot of the query for the catch. Yeah, that's it. So my question really is, that because I can see, um, constituents jumping on this a little bit and I just I'm trying to figure out what a good answer might be. So for a black sea bass in the mid-Atlantic on your party boat, you've got a hundred percent imputed data, yet the PSE for that estimate is quite low. And then above that you've got black sea bass on shore, which has a very low imputed data, um, but, but a very high PSE. So Clearly, there's no impact of the amount of contribution of imputed data on the PSC. But I just wondered, you know, especially given the, you know, the criteria that are coming forward about not publishing data with certain whose PSC is greater than a certain amount. I forget what it is. Um, I just wondered if you had any comment on that sort of relationship between an estimate that's almost 100% imputed and to JMAX point, you know, how to characterize the uncertainty and how do we, you know, is it explainable that an imputed estimate has a has a very low PSC, if that makes sense, I think. I yeah, know that, that makes perfect sense. Um, and the, and the, what you pointed out is exactly right, is that the the um, <clears throat> variance estimation process makes no distinction between different years of data. The only thing it, it takes into consideration is the weighting applied to the, the data. So there's, you know, there are some things possibly that we can do to better tie the contribution of the um, imputed data to, to the variance estimate. So I, I, you know, that would be something that we can look at this year to see if there's a better metric that we can apply. I think, I mean, our concern is really, you know, if people see that, you know, all of the data comes from the 2020, 18, uh, 2019 year, um, regardless of the PSE, then it should be treated with some caution. But I think that you're, you're right there, there might be uh, a need for at least um, some other metric that might uh, frame the, the variance estimate a little better. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. Next hand up is uh, Chris Bat Savage. Chris, what was yours? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. Dr. Cody. Learn something new every time I see this presentation. So I appreciate you giving it again. Um, on the heat maps, uh, where you showed the different sampling uh, by state over the course of 2020 and how to compare to you know, the other years. Um, I think you mentioned that uh, some of that was due to just limitations by what the samplers were able to do as far as sampling in, in the different states. Um, how did, uh, did, did the refusal rate by fishermen play a role in, in getting, getting fewer samples just due to their concerns with social distancing in the pandemic? And, and if so, has that, uh, Refusal rate by anglers improved in 2021. Thanks. Yeah, I don't. I don't have the actual numbers for um, the refusal rates, or at least mid-interview refusals. But we could we could look at that for certain. Um, my my um, guess is, and this is a guess, is that it's a mix of of different things. We, we know, for instance, in in the conversations that I had with some of the state directors that there were concerns in some regions and some states with the ability of, of samplers to conduct their 
their uh, surveys uh, safely. And it wasn't so much based on uh, whether an angler um, was, uh, was, uh, would participate or not, or hostile or not. It, it had a lot to do with the amount of anglers that were present on a site and how crowded a site was. So, you know, that, that I think, played a role um, probably more so than I, than I think, um, um, you know, refusals did. But we can certainly look at the refusal rates um, across the different modes uh, to see if that was the case. Thank you, Richard. Um, I don't have any more hands up at this time. Um, why don't we move right along into your second presentation? All right, thank you. All right, if um, I think I'm trying to remember which slide uh, it, we need to go to, but uh, if you could if you could move on down to the, I think there's a title slide, I hope. Yep, there we go. So. So in, in December of 2020, uh, MRIP unveiled their, their estimates, or not their estimates, but their survey and data standards. And um, if I could have the ne next slide, please. And the whole idea or the focus of, of the data standards were to, to guide uh, the design and improvement and quality of information produced by the, the various surveys uh, participating in MRIP, and also to provide guidance for uh, state level surveys uh, in terms of uh, precision levels, um, compatibility, and um, some of the parameters that would be important uh, in terms of uh, their comparability of, of information um, to other surveys. So next slide. And, and why did we uh, do this? Well, um, probably the most uh, important driver for it was advice that came from uh, the 2020, 2017 uh, National Academies uh, review. And their uh, message was that we establish uh, performance standards and guidance for um, regional uh, surveys. So, um, and that was really a, um, a recommendation that NOAA uh, provide some leadership in terms of um, uh, guidance for development of, of surveys. Um, following up on that, and we just got the, the 2021 uh, National Academies review of uh, data management and strategies uh, with respect to ACLs, um, there's information in there that would probably modify or at least uh, be added to some of the recommendations that were provided earlier by the National Academies in terms of um, uh, the, the um, components that we have identified as different um, standards, so such as transitioning of surveys and, and development of, of surveys. Uh, so we're looking at those right now, and you know, it's gonna take a while to, uh, I think, um, nail down the different recommendations and our responses to it, but, um, I can provide people with the uh, link to this report if, if you're so interested um, and the, uh, the guidance and the uh, uh, recommendations are, are largely um, summarized in the, the final two chapters of that report. So, and then lastly, the main reason or the other reason why we developed um, these standards is to support our uh, strategic goals to, to, to provide quality products and ensure sound science. So um, those are the two main drivers, as I said, for, for the development of these standards. And I'm not going to go into an awful lot of detail right now on what's, what the specifics are for the standards, but I will summarize what the, the, the basic categories of, of the different standards and, and we'll focus a little bit of attention to the publication standard, which I think um, is the main concern of, of this group. So next slide. So um, some of the, the um, building blocks or the framework used to develop these standards um, largely come from uh, existing federal guidelines and, and best practices. 
in terms of uh, the dissemination of st statistical information. Um, we noted that you know most surveys have um, precision standards that they maintain for uh, the publication of data, and um, we you know felt that you know we needed to be consistent with those surveys in terms of the standard of information that we provide. So some of the sources that we looked at um, were the national academies themselves. They have um, a report on. Uh, principles and practices for federal agencies. There's also an OMB um, uh, um, guideline or document that for standards and, and guidelines for statistical surveys. And then also there are various uh, other survey documentation available and, and surveys themselves that have information available on their practices, such as the CDC, the Census Bureau, um, the U.S. or uh, the United Nations, and um, and then various um, collaborative, uh, I'll call it uh, international types of of surveys that are conducted um, sort of collaboratively with different um, country and state uh, entities. And then we have the Australian uh, Bureau of Statistics. So those are some of the sources that we we use to uh, come up with the standards. Next uh, slide. So as I mentioned, uh, there were seven uh, standards in all, and they have various components to them, and I, and I won't get too much into the details here. But the whole idea here is to provide you know, our partners and our, our stakeholders with a single set of guidelines um, with respect to those seven uh, standards and um, <clears throat> focusing on, on recreational data collection and estimation. So next slide. So I'll, I'll kind of, sorry for breezing through these, but um, I'm going to clump the, the, the standards, you know, three per slide and then focus on the last one uh, separately. So the first one pertains to survey concepts and justification. And really this is about identifying the need for the survey uh, whether it be a legislative mandate or uh, a data need um, in a, within a region that's not being met. Um, also, um, how the survey plans to uh, produce the key statistics that are needed uh, and uh, provide information on precision or uncertainty uh, with, with the survey. And then, of course, uh, from the federal perspective, there's um, if there are some legislative mandate, mandates, um, there may be a need to look at uh, adherence to OMB uh, guidelines for paper or work reduction um, and reducing uh, respondent um, responsibility on surveys as well. Um, the second one is largely a documentation um, uh, standard. And basically what it tries to do is to provide some guidance so that when multiple sources of data are provided, say for stock assessment purposes or for management purposes, um, they have comparable information of sufficient quality to be able to compare uh, those uh, surveys design designs. And those surveys designs are adequately described within those. And then the important, an important aspect of that would be the tie-in between the survey design and the actual estimation that they they match up um, accordingly. And then the third one here is data quality, and that describes some uh, procedures for data processing and handling uh, things like item non-response and uh, weighting of data, things like that, that um, help with um, uh, evaluating the response, the responses that are received uh, for a given survey, and also providing some guidance on where these adjustments are made within the the process for estimation. So next slide. So um, these next three slides, and I, I think the the last two uh, as well, the last two standards really refer to um, developing. Uh, implementing surveys and transitioning between surveys and and also the quality control 
that's needed for this uh, um, for the improvement process. So number four here talks about transition planning, and you know, um, as part of our certification process, one of the things that that surveys or sponsors for surveys are supposed to have is a transition plan for for the survey. So if it's replacing a uh, and another source of data, or it's uh, augmenting another sort of source of data. There should be a plan in place to handle uh, the transition. And that might mean um, developing uh, calibrations for that survey if needed, and taking into consideration any breaks that might occur in a in a time series. Um, I will point out that for a lot of surveys, they 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 don't produce. Um, a calibrated continuation of a time series or a calibration is going back in time. Um, many times what's done is uh, a break in the survey uh, timeline is indicated and um, a disclaimer is put in there that data before and after the break can't be compared directly. And they leave it up to the data user to um, find ways to do that. Uh, the review procedures, um, uh, some of you here, uh, uh, Jay and McNamee in particular is familiar with some of the review processes that we have in place for what we um, for the calibration um, that we use for the APIS and, and the FES surveys. And um, so it, it's important that there's um, a comparable level of review and that the review uh, methods are are meaningful and consistent. So. Um, we, uh, you know, we we put some emphasis there on on that, and um, tie it into the existing certification requirements that we have uh, developed through our policy and procedural directives. And then six, the process for improvement. Uh, one thing that's important with surveys is that you know it is a constant quest for improvement. So it's to be expected that surveys are not static entities; they respond to the populations that they're trying to uh, monitor. And so there may be uh, uh, improvements or changes made to the surveys over time, and it's important that those are, are documented and at least uh, accounted for in comparisons of, of data where um, there have been survey changes made. And then lastly, the next slide. Um, and I'd say, you know, for the first six uh, standards that we rolled out, we didn't get much in the way of, I would say, um, negative feedback. For this seventh standard here, we did receive, um, you know, some concerns from stakeholders and data users that this would restrict access to data. And, and we do recognize that, that that's an issue. So what, what this standard does is, you know, we Currently, we publish um, uh, all uh, PSEs or all estimates with PSEs uh, of, of all levels. Uh, we do flag the ones that occur above 50%, uh, but it's common practice among you know, most of the statistical surveys to provide a cutoff for a, for a reasonable estimate or for a valid estimate at around with a PSE of around 30% you will see some variation among surveys. Um, our plan is to, um, you know, realizing that we do have uh, data needs uh, and we do have users that um, may have a need to examine the data. Um, we're, we're not being as restrictive in our, or as conservative in our, our PSE standard. We are pushing that to 50%. So instead of flagging values that are above 50%, um, we, we, will, we will now be uh, adhering to that uh, standard of 50% that those estimates above that will, will not be published on a, on a wave level. Um, we, we have tried to uh, put into effect some ways to mitigate the data loss or the concerns over the data. One being that we would produce um, estimates that are cumulative. So at some point during the year for most estimates, um, those, those values would uh, uh, reach the 50% the 50, the 50 threshold and be published. Um, obviously for some 
species at some uh, domain levels, uh, we won't be able to, to reach that. Um, that said, we're, we're not planning to leave people just to fend for, them, for themselves. And if you go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, the, the intent of the, the standards were, were to really, to, augment, or to, to use practices that were already in use largely, um, and to remove, remove some of the ambiguities over whether something is a practice or a, a recommendation, and, and provide some clear guidance on that. So if we go to the, the next slide, um, we, we realize that there, there are some impacts that are expected from the rollout of, of, these, uh, of these standards, and in particular, the last one, the publication standards. So ultimately, the goal here is to promote uh, data quality, consistency, and comparability. And, and the standards, we hope, um, will you know, improve our ability to ensure integrity and the quality of our, our statistics, but also um, put our money where our mouth is in terms of our, um, uh, our standing behind an estimate that we publish on our, on our website. So um, if we go to the next slide. So what, what we plan to do is not just um, you know, flip a switch at some point and the queries won't be available. Uh, we, we plan to do this as a phased approach. And as I mentioned earlier, we, we do expect some input from the current um, National Academies review, which will take some time to assess. And realistically, we had looked at uh, the standards for uh, data access and publication um, being implemented no sooner than 2022. But I think that that date is probably pushed out possibly a year at this point, because there are some things that we would like to do before we, we get to that uh, stage. And one is to produce a, a data user manual, which we're in the process of doing right now. Um, we also uh, plan to hold some data user workshops, which will provide guidance and tools on how to um, you know, do custom um, estimates for the data that, that are available. Uh, the difference being that you know those estimates that that would have been available now would have to be uh, produced um, by the the data user, or uh, with with our help um, would not be published on our on our website. And then um, the idea also would be in this data user workshop that we would preview some of the anticipated changes to the the query tool. Um, and have uh, input from the users on on what that might um, look like, and if there are improvements that could be made that would still be consistent with the with the standard, we would be able to do that. But uh, as I said, you know, the the idea isn't to just flip the switch and um, remove people's ability to uh, get to estimates at a, at a wave level for you know that are somewhat imprecise or, or highly imprecise, we, we will provide uh, tools and guidance on how to, to do custom estimates. So I think that's the, the last uh, slide. Um, there may be one more. Yeah, that's it. Um, there is some information on the uh, website regarding the, the standards. And I said, we're in an early stage of development here. We are in the process of producing the um, the data users guide. So, and you know that's going to take some time to to happen. And as I said, this is a phased approach. So we will be working you know, with our state partners um, to make sure that you know people have the tools they need to to get the information they need. So I think that's it. Unless people have questions. Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, we do have one hand up, uh, Bill Hyatt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I have kind of a general question. It's not specific to the data standards, but more general in nature. Um, if a state had a, a desire or a need to increase the precisions of estimates of catch and effort for, say, a 
specific fishery or specific area, um, presumably by increasing their sample size by some amount. Could you talk for a minute about the possibilities of doing that um, and, you know, figuring out what is needed to achieve what, you know, those objectives of increased precision, what the process and the timing might be? And I'm just curious if there are any states that are doing that for specific uh, fisheries or areas. Yeah, th thanks for the question. Um, there is flexibility within the uh, APIS draw to add sample uh, and to actually even target sample to say an offshore mode or, or to um, you know state waters or federal waters. There, there are some um, ways that, that sampling can be targeted that way. Um, now that said, you know the, the, we, we were able to, to get some funding through the Modern Fish Act that uh, that you know where we would try to uh, identify or not identify, but uh, to address uh, the primary um, uh, regional implementation plan priority for the Atlantic states, and that was uh, improving precision and sample size. Um, you know, nine hundred k sounds like a lot of money, um, but you know it, it only goes so far. Uh, I think. You know, from from my perspective, we we do need the standards to help us identify where the gaps are in terms of uh, possibly um, improving sample uh, sizes or the coverage of of the different surveys. So it, it does set us out, set ourselves up for some criticism, but in in the long run, I think it does provide us with some way to assess uh, improvements as they occur um, there is uh, the the only thing I would say is that you know we we you know we'll work with ACCSP and the states to you know um, a lot the funding that we have available to us to you know try to address the the primary um, precision concerns um, as best we can um, you know within the constraints of the survey but there, there are some things I think that can be done um, in terms of the flexibility of the draw to incorporate sample that might uh, improve precision uh, of some species. That's probably a roundabout way of saying that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so so just, just wondering if, if a specific state wanted to allocate funding, for example, to increase sampling, um, is there the the option of doing that and 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 are say federal statisticians available to work with state folks to figure out what actually needs to be done yeah we, and again we, is, we is already there, do that. Are states doing it yeah we we already do that to to some extent with some of the other states and in particular in the gulf where we coordinate our our um, sample draws and there are you know, we have in the past had had state add-ons in North Carolina and other states um, that uh, add sample to what's available through MRIP. So in some cases, uh, the states uh, will identify um, how much personnel that they may have available. And the draw is flexible enough to account for the addition of personnel or the addition of um, uh, assignments to, to the draw. So, for instance, if the states, uh, if a state, for instance, wants to um, say double their uh, sample size, that's that's a fairly easy undertaking uh, to to do. It, it's just a matter of uh, refining the draw so that it knows there are you know more samples available and that um, sample draw can be increased. Mr. Chairman, this is Jeff White with ACCSP. I, I have my hand up when you want to get there. Thanks, Jeff. Your hand does not show on my screen. So um, first up is Erica Burgess. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to take this opportunity to respond to that last question by highlighting the Florida State State Reef Fish Survey, which we're very proud of in Florida. We worked with um, the MRIP folks to develop this supplemental survey to MRIP, first to improve estimates of recreational 
catch and harvest of free fish on the Gulf Coast. And our state legislature appropriated continuing funding for it to extend throughout our state. I know Richard was fairly, very closely involved in the development of that program when he was with FWC and as he transitioned over to NOAA. Um, I don't have the exact numbers for how it improved precision with me right now, but um, if anyone would like to know more about how we're approaching it in Florida, I'd be happy to talk with you after the meeting. Erica, yeah, thank you, for, Erica, for that context. Yeah, thanks for opening, uh, offering that up, Erica. Um, do we have any other members of the policy board that have questions for Richard? I don't see any other hands. Uh, Jeff, you want to go ahead? Yes, thank you very much. And just as an organizer from the last meeting, um, I wasn't able to raise my hand. So uh, uh, sorry for keeping in that way. So Richard, thank you again for the presentation um, and the opportunities kind of to, to discuss this. You know, ACCSP has a role in state conduct. Um, and so the, for the rest of the policy board, states that have already been doing state funded add-ons uh, include Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Delaware, and North Carolina. Um, and when that's organized and done with you know, state staff or or other staff. It's actually a very open process to say, if you want more additional sample and to request that through um, ACCSP and MREP in the process to to add those samples. Uh, I do think Tom Schmicky and the the rest of the MREP team have been able to help guide what would help what would make the most impact on on PSC for particular fisheries. Uh, one of the things with the Modern Fish Act, $900,000, um, that resulted in about 2,000 additional, you know, six-hour site assignments for the calendar year 2021. Um, that was spread across all of the states um, and is is in process of occurring. So that's that's going on. And and if there's desire to do additional sampling. Um, please from Maine through Georgia, Florida's handed through through the Gulf Commission, uh, then please please let us know. Um, on, a, on a different tack, of course, ECCSP is also kind of a data user and stakeholder. And I wanna offer that we've been in contact with them a lot about the survey data standards and presentation. And you know we'll be attending the user workshops and we're looking forward to ways um, that we can help with kind of standardized data access to to more detailed um, you know domain estimates, which is the the smaller scale, the wave based estimates or or other things to help the management process along the Atlantic coast. So I don't know exactly what that will look like yet, uh, but we're certainly uh, participating in the process to to help that out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time to comment. Thanks, Jeff. Um... Are there any other additional um, questions from the policy board? Seeing no hands and hearing nobody jumping in. Richard, thank you very much for those presentations. We appreciate uh, the thoroughness of them. And uh, unless you have any closing comments, we're gonna move right along. No, the only thing I would mention is that my, my email is on the, the first slide, so if anybody has any uh, follow-up questions, um, you know, please, please feel free to uh, contact me, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk to this group. Thank you. You bet. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, we're going to move right along on the agenda. Next up are the reports from both the Executive Committee and the State Directors meeting, and I'm going to jump right into those. Um, this past Monday morning, um, the state directors had an opportunity to get together with NOAA leadership, uh, included the uh, new assistant administrator for fisheries, Janet Coit, along with Sam Rausch and Paul Dramus. There was uh, there were a lot of folks from from the agency on uh, on the on the webinar, but uh, it, we did have leadership from the science centers and. Uh, and the regional offices as well, but uh, I'm not going to go into all the names. But uh, you folks, you folks know who they are. Um, it, it was really good to uh, have an opportunity to have Janet be part of the meeting. She stayed on for the entire meeting, which was appreciated. 
um, gave us uh, an overview of what she sees uh, the big priorities uh, as she's coming into her new new role. Uh, I know I, for one, uh, am excited to have somebody with a with a state background coming into this. I think she'll she'll come at it with a perspective of understanding uh, the concerns that that we raise as a commission and as as states. Uh, so that's uh, I think that's good news for us. Um, in particular, uh, her comments were focused around climate change, offshore wind, diversity, uh, North Atlantic right whales, bycatch, and seafood marketing. And a pretty good, um, pretty good discussion about all of those uh, about all those issues. Um, and uh, it's clear that she's going to remain uh, personally engaged with the commission. Um, her former role as Secretary of an Environmental Agency for the state of Rhode Island certainly gives a, her a lot of background on, on all of those particular issues. And it's nice to have somebody that's coming in with that fishery perspective, again, from the state, from the state level. Um, we also had a, a presentation from Paul Doremus on the federal budget. Um, Paul gave, uh, gave a very high level overview. There are a lot of pieces to this. I think the take home is that there were some uh, good news um, in, in these particular budgets. Um, and uh, I think some of that good news will spread down to benefiting the state and the commission. Um, immediately following that, um, uh, our executive director gave a, um, an overview of the commission's budget priorities. And um, you could definitely see some overlap between these two, which was good to see. Uh, in particular, the top items were the Atlantic Coastal Act, NEMAP, CMAP, ACCSP, and FINS, uh, as well as the Interjurisdictional Fisheries Act and Recreational Data Collection. So again, a lot of overlap between uh, our priorities and, and what we heard within uh, the federal budget. So uh, some additional good news. Um, Jennifer Anderson from GARFO also did a, uh, an update on uh, the right whale conservation framework that was uh, included in the most recent buy-up for right whales. Uh, as a reminder, that's a 10-year uh, rebuilding plan, um, and it, uh, it's going to touch us all now. Um, you, I'm sure you all participated in the uh, presentation. Um, by GARFO um, beyond uh, the trap pot fisheries for lobsters. So uh, certainly gill nets and other trap pot fisheries uh, up and down the East Coast are uh, gonna come into play now. So uh, we can all enjoy uh, the discussions on this instead of just the Northeast now. Um, and uh, Brian McManus from, uh, from Florida did a presentation on fisheries disaster assistance, uh, the process and the improvements that were needed I uh, went over some of the improvements. Um, the exec, he's, we've had some of these conversations at the executive committee. It was good to be able to elevate it to the agency directly with Janet being involved. Uh, no additional information there, but uh, certainly uh, it was good to get that in front of them. And then um, lastly is this issue, um, which, is a, which is a high priority for uh, the Biden administration, which is um, uh, diversity within the regional fisheries management councils, uh, along with uh, the appointments that are going to be made. Um, both Janet and Sam uh, led the discussion on this and raised the issue of expanding diversity on the councils. Uh, a lot of very good input from the states. Um, uh, I think a lot of us uh, that have um, advisory panels within our agencies certainly use those as a stepping stone into coming up and, and getting more involved in fisheries management issues. So um, uh, there's a lot of conversation around that and around the use of uh, around the use of committees as well. And it's something that um, uh, we commented on from a commission perspective that uh, that we may need to um, take a look at as we move forward, and especially with our advisory panels. So um, I'm going to that that concludes the, the big items um, from the state directors meeting, and I'm not even going to pause there. I'm going to go right into the executive committee meeting, um, and um, uh, that was held yesterday morning. And uh, I'll leave some room at the end to take a few uh, take a few questions if there are any. Um, the executive committee met yesterday morning. Uh, the uh, executive director did a CARES Act update, uh, gave us a quick update on uh, CARES Act 2.0, as I call it. Um, um, 
about half of the states have filed spend plans with the commission. Um, Bob did remind us all to not panic too much um, and because there is a September 30th deadline uh, within the federal statute uh, around spending the money. Um, that's not a hard deadline. There's a lot of flexibility around that. Uh, the good news is we have the, the, the money in hand um, and uh, we will have time beyond that to spend it. Uh, I mean, some, some of us may not even get finalized until right up until that deadline as far as our spend plans are concerned. So uh, that flexibility and that uh, report out on that uh, was certainly appreciated. Uh, next up on the agenda was the uh, report from the Administrative Oversight Committee, and it was a very quick report because the committee didn't have an opportunity to meet. Um, uh, the AOC uh, was scheduled to meet to address an issue of the investments uh, that we have w within the uh, within our finance side of the business around the commission, and uh, we'll be doing so between now and the annual meeting, and uh, we'll report out to the policy board at that time. Um, the next item on the agenda was to discuss the meeting attendance and future meeting formats. Um, again, our executive director reported out uh, on the results of the survey that was uh, sent out to everybody. Around 34 people uh, filled out the survey. All did state that they were going to attend uh, the in-person annual meeting, but they also had a, a caveat to say, you know, if things change within the pandemic, um, then that may change um, uh, their thinking of where we're going. Now, immediately following the release of the survey and as we're gathering information back at the office, um, we started hearing the concerns around the Delta variants. Uh, we started to see an uptick in uh, the uh, infection rates around the country and some of the high level infection rates. And so, um, you know, you're all watching the news. I don't need to go into that, but uh, it does leave a question mark uh, going forward, um, in particular, looking at the annual meeting this October. Uh, the executive committee um, leadership will continue to report to the executive committee during these interim meetings between now and the annual meeting. And if we see that we need to make it any kind of change between now and then, uh, we will uh, obviously report out to the full commission. Um, uh, Bob and I did discuss this particular issue this morning, and we would encourage you at this time not to start buying plane tickets for the annual meeting. Um, just put a hold on those. We'll continue to communicate um, uh, around that. Um, right now, um, uh, Joe Smino is keeping us up to date on any issues going into uh, into New Jersey. Um, there is no right now. He reported out that it's status quo there right now. Um, but as we all know, things can change and can change quickly. Um, I would also ask the state directors, if you have any policy changes um, in the coming weeks that would impact your travel, uh, to please um, let uh, Bob or I know uh, as soon as possible. Uh, the, I know here in Maine, we um, had, a, had a meeting earlier this week uh, it was reported out that we may see some uh, additional travel restrictions depending on what goes on with the rest of the country. So I'm sure we're, all of our agencies are going to be hearing from our respective governor's offices on things like that. So any information you have uh, to give us to, that you can give us a head up, a heads up on would be very much appreciated. Um, uh, the we also had a discussion on pending shark finning legislation. Uh, there's several bills in Congress. Um, uh, Deke and Bob gave us an update on where those are. Deke gave a thorough update of the conversations that have been happening with our legislative committee. Um, uh, there are, uh, in particular, there are a few different processes that each bill uh, looks at from. Uh, a, a banning of sale of, of fins to more of a fisheries management approach. Uh, no action was uh, taken by the executive committee other than to uh, ask the uh, legislative committee to continue to remain fully engaged in that, uh, in that topic uh, and to report out to the executive committee if there's any change. Um, and that leads us into other new business that was brought up uh, to the executive committee. Um, uh, the first item was uh, uh, the Recovering Americans Wildlife Act, or RAWA. Um, 
for those of you who don't know, it's a bill that provides funding for the conservation and restoration of wildlife and plant species of the greatest conservation in need or listed species. Um, uh, the wildlife conservation strategies uh, of states, Indian tribes or territories and wildlife conservation education and recreational projects. Um, the commission um, has had some conversations with AFLAR on this particular issue and we've uh, engaged our legislative committee and uh, earlier this summer the executive committee approved a letter uh, to support RAWA uh, to, and sent that letter to house leadership and at yesterday's uh, yesterday's executive committee meeting um, approved sending a letter a second letter that will be sent to, to Senate leadership uh, as the bill moves in that direction so uh, the, this, this particular bill just to, to put a little bit more uh, uh, finer point on it this is uh, money that would come in through uh, other federal funds, and then if the bill passes, it would be uh, money that would be directed back out to the states to work on those species of the greatest uh, greatest need. So, um, I certainly uh, would be um, uh, much needed money for the states um, as we work uh, on issues uh, related to ESA. And then lastly, um, uh, Dennis Abbott raised the issue of conservation equivalencies. Uh, there's been a lot of focus on the, uh, this as a management tool as of late, especially as it related to the striped bass addendum. Um, because of this question, because the question was asked by Dennis, um, his, his thinking was, should we be having a statewide or commission-wide, excuse me, uh, conversation around this particular issue? Uh, there was a good discussion at the executive committee, um, and there was a recommendation that maybe the management and science committee look at this um, it was felt uh, as the conversation uh, continued that it probably wouldn't be a good idea to just send it to him broadly and say hey look at our policy around conservation equivalencies let us know what you think um, so a small work group um, is going to be established uh, that work group will look at the existing policy look at uh, more broadly uh, at some of the most recent conversations and then make some recommendations on whether uh, we should make any uh, or, or what actually make some recommendations on what the focus of a conversation with the Management Science Committee would would be. So um, that that is going to move forward and then obviously any uh, any actions uh, that come up through the committee process will come back to the policy board for further conversations. And that concluded the business of the executive committee. Uh, at this point in time, I'd be happy to answer. That's a lot of information between the two state directors and executive committee meetings, but uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions or take any comments on those on those items. I am not seeing any hands. Um, Bob, did I miss anything just uh, before I move on to the next agenda item? No, I don't think you missed anything. Just one thing to add to it and, and a segue for your next agenda item is <clears throat> when um, Janet Coit was giving her presentation and sort of the important issues for that she'll be working on, one of the things she brought up was governance along the East Coast and you know noted the difficulties of climate change and how quickly things are changing and, and the relationship between the three councils and ASMFC and the 15 states. And, and it's just a really complex structure. And she was looking sort of within the existing laws on what could be done to, to streamline governance or, or have governance be more responsive to uh, climate change. So and one of the things she brought up was the very next agenda item, which is the scenario planning um, initiative along the East Coast, and which will bring together all three councils and the commission, and, and Tony will explain that better. But I think, you know, governance along the East Coast is is on Janet's radar, and that was, you know, interesting to hear from me. Uh, great, yeah, that, that uh, certainly was. I, um, I'm glad you reminded me of that because when that issue did came up, I, I came back around to it with her because um, governance. When you, when you hear government is broadly, and she's focusing on the East Coast, it was wondering if that was going to include the commission and the commission process. And uh, the examples she gave certainly didn't at this time, but it'll be interesting to see how things move forward, uh, especially. Um, with uh, reauthorization of Magnuson if uh, if that gets any traction in the future and it's obviously something our legislative committee is going to have to keep a really close eye on. 
uh, and that was an excellent pivot. Um, before I do pivot all the way over to Tony, um, just looking for any hands, if there are any comments. Seeing no hands, uh, let's uh, let's segue right into the next item then, an update on East Coast climate change scenario planning. Tony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Maya, for pulling the presentation up. As a reminder, this East Coast Climate Change Scenario Planning is an initiative that we are working on with NOAA Fisheries and the three Atlantic Coastal um, Fishery Management Councils. Um, so it is a cooperative effort. Next slide, please. Um, and just a quick reminder of what this scenario planning initiative is. This initiative is a way of exploring how fishery management might have to evolve in the next couple of decades as climate change, become, climate change becomes a bigger issue. We don't know exactly how climate change will play out and the precise effects that it'll have. So we're using scenario planning to explore what might happen and think through what we need to do in order to adapt to those potential changes. Scenarios are stories about possible future developments. We create different scenarios, thinking of things like a rain shift here, warm waters go there, wind farms are and over here, um, to imagine the worlds that we could face in the decades ahead. Then we use these worlds to think about the changes we as managers need to make now to be better prepared for the future. In this case, we're thinking broadly about the implications of climate change for the East Coast fishery management and governance process, but we expect that the conversations could take us into other territories as well. More than anything else, these scenarios are structured in an engaging way to bring a variety of people together with different perspectives to discuss complex issues. And in this case, it's all about how we as fishery managers and stakeholders prepare for the future of climate change. And for our specific process, um, the project ob objectives hope to explore how, oh, next slide, Maya, sorry. Um, uh, our objectives are to explore how fishery governance and management issues will be affected by climate change in fisheries, particularly shifting stock availability just and distributions on the East Coast. And second, to develop a set of tools and processes which provide flexible and resilient fisheries management strategies that will effectively address uncertainty in an era of climate change. Next slide, please. Um, our draft uh, project focal question is how might climate change affect stock distribution, availability, and other aspects of East Coast marine fisheries over the next 20 years? And what does it mean for the future of governance and management across multiple jurisdictions? Some of the expected outcomes that we are thinking we're going to get is a set of scenarios. So these are a few stories that describe in qualitative terms different ways the changing climate might affect the future of fisheries. We'll have a better understanding of the challenges and opportunities facing fishery management. We'll look at a set of near-term and long-term management priorities that help achieve fishery management objectives under different future conditions. We'll have policy recommendations for broader governance changes that could improve our ability to adapt to these future scenarios. We'll have a list of data gaps and research needs and monitoring needs for changing conditions and a framework for ongoing conversations and idea generations for all stakeholders to use. Next slide, please. Um, and this is just a quick timeline or uh, process steps that we're going to be using. Um, currently, we are in the scoping, we're, we're about to be in the scoping stage. Um, the core group, which includes um, members from each of the participating organizations for the last couple of months have been busy um, putting together draft objectives and expected outcomes and working on a presentation that we're going to use with stakeholders for scoping. Um, after we scope, we'll go through the exploration stage where we analyze different forces driving climate change in greater detail through a series of, um, uh, through the analysis of the scoping. And then we will conduct a series of workshops to construct and discuss different scenarios. 
and then we'll use the scenarios to identify actions and recommendations to the management bodies. And then from there, we'll identify key indicators to monitor change and outline the next steps. And so, as I just said, we are stepping into the scoping stage. And in the next couple of weeks, you'll see press releases from each of the participating organizations announcing kickoff webinars to introduce the, um, the initiative. Um, you see on the screen here are the dates of those webinars. And this is really to introduce climate change and scenario planning to um, both managers and stakeholders and we're looking for all different kinds of stakeholders to come and learn about this process and to start to gather some information following the um, the webinars we will put out a questionnaire to gather um, information from the public on on these driving forces so that is all i have mr chairman i can take any questions Thank you, Tony. Any questions for Tony? Um, uh, John Clark. Yeah, Tony, I was just curious. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I was curious if one of the scenarios being discussed will cover a situation such as black sea bass where the stock is still abundant in its original range, but has expanded greatly into a new range because as we saw, that definitely leads to a very difficult situation to manage. John, the scenarios are not predefined. So through the scoping process, we'll hear all different types of ideas. So that is something that you can bring to the process. Um, I can't imagine that rain shifts and abundance shifts are not, um, wouldn't be part of those discussions, but um, you know, anything is fair game. And we don't predetermine what the scenarios will be. Okay, thanks for the question, John. Any other hands? I am not seeing any hands. Tony, thank you for that update. Um, moving right along on the agenda, the next item is update on the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council's Research Steering Committee to evaluate restarting the research set-aside program. And I've got Adam Nowalski up for this one. Adam, are you there? Yes, good afternoon, I am. So appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I am uh, chair of the Mid-Atlantic Council's Research Steering Committee. Uh, the Research Steering Committee has been spearheading the council's effort uh, with these RSA workshops, uh, research set aside is something that has been a collaborative effort between a lot of organizations, including uh, the ASMFC. Uh, when the program was suspended a number of years ago, there was discussion last year, uh, prior to last year, about how best to consider restarting the program and what would need to change. Uh, so these workshops were developed with the goal to develop recommendations regarding whether and how the RSA program should be redeveloped. So it's just important to note that uh, restarting of the program itself is not a foregone conclusion as part of this process. That is one of the questions uh, that we intend to answer. Uh, originally, we had planned to do a couple of in-person workshops uh, last year during 2020. Uh, COVID put a halt on that. Uh, we had at the council and committee level considered whether to delay the in-person workshops until after the health emergency had completely passed and we could, could definitely meet in person. Uh, the decision was made to, due to the uncertainty, to try to get a jump start on things. So the committee went with a a uh, hybrid approach where we're hosting three webinars with one planned in-person workshop later this year. Our first workshop was held on July 15th. Uh, we had approximately 40 participants in addition to members of the public. Those participants came uh, from a number of states 
uh, and different groups uh, at the federal and state level uh, with experience either in administering the program or taking part of it, uh, including fishermen that have been part of the program, uh, a number of uh, people that had participated as principal investigators on projects as well. Uh, again, that first workshop from July 15th was focused on a research aspect. Uh, next steps for the process is to hold our second workshop, which will center around funding concerns. That is scheduled for August 31st. The third workshop will center discussion around enforcement concerns. That is scheduled for October 14th. And the in-person workshop is presently scheduled to be held in Baltimore on November, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Baltimore, yep. I uh, just wanted to make sure it wasn't Annapolis, but it is Baltimore uh, for November 16th. Uh, again, we're hoping to be able to do that in person, but as the uh, executive committee discussion went about uh, in-person meetings, we'll play it by ear, see how things go, and hope for the best. I'll extend a word of thanks for all those people from the commission who did participate in the first workshop. Look forward to their continued contributions and be happy to take any other questions. Thank you again for the time. Great. Thanks, Adam, for that report. Um, any questions from the policy board for Adam? Not seeing any hands going up, Adam. You're off the hook. Um, perfect. Let's move right along to the next item, which are committee reports, uh, starting off with the uh, Assessment Science Committee. Um, who's up for that one? Sarah? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Maya, if you could bring up the slides, that would be great. I'll just give a brief report from the Assessment Science Committee. Next slide, please. So the committee met on May 13th to address uh, several agenda items, including assessment reports, streamlining 2020 data challenges, and revising the stock assessment schedule. Next slide. The schedule proposed by the ASC is available in meeting materials. However, I will also briefly review the changes that have been made to the schedule since the board last approved it at the 2020 summer meeting. Next slide. First, the update of the ecological reference point assessment that was on the schedule for 2022 was removed per the ERP work group's recommendation to only update the single species assessment or the BAM model before the next benchmark. For striped bass, the assessment update was shifted from 2021 to 2022 to allow time for management changes to take effect and also to avoid challenges that could result from having a 2020 terminal year for the assessment. The 2023 assessment for striped bass, the assessment update was also shifted to 2024 to maintain the two-year assessment update schedule. A benchmark assessment for black drum was scheduled for 2022 per the black drum technical committee's recommendation. The assessment schedule was revised for river herring. There was just a, an error that indicated it was an update when in fact it will be a benchmark assessment. And then finally, the Spanish mackerel assessment has been shifted from 2021 to a 2022 expected completion. Next slide, please. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions on the proposed schedule. Thank you. Um, let's see, we've got uh, one hand up with questions. Chris Batsavage. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for uh, uh, presenting the schedule. It's pretty busy for the next few years. Um, I noticed that uh, weakfish and cobia aren't on the uh, on the list just for the next few years. Are those going to be? Are, I guess are those on the horizon uh, from say 2025 onward? Um, I don't know if the uh, Assessment Science Committee has talked about future plans for those two species. Thanks. Yeah, I don't have the uh, 
schedule in front of me for the NRCC, Katie or others may have a better recollection of that. My my thought is that yes, they are on the horizon. Um, if anyone has that off the top of your head, uh, feel free to chime in. Not hearing anybody else chime in. Um, Cobia would be on the CDAR, Sarah, and weak fish would just be something that we would do. And I would, oh, sorry, I I heard okay. winter flounder, and I uh, uh, it Cobia and weak fish, and I Kobe and weak I don't fish. remember weak fish off the top of my head. What the TC recommended last year? Yeah, I would. Um, I, I know that last time around we sort of. Um, pushed for an update to, to align with the ERP assessment. So I would hope and guess that that may be the case as well, in, in which case that uh, would be an update in 2022. But um, I can't promise things for the weak fish. Uh, so, uh, Sarah, Pat's got his hand up. He might be able to help us out. Yep. Uh, thanks, Tony. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, for Cobia specifically, um, I'm digging for the CDAR schedule right now, but we'll have to get back to you um, as it shows on the schedule here. Cobia uh, was assessed a couple of years ago, and that was a, a multi-year effort to evaluate Cobia stock structure as well as uh, follow that with the benchmark assessment. So um, I, I think it will be several years um, and perhaps beyond this 2024 horizon. Uh, in terms of what the the CDAR um, crowd is is considering, but uh, I might pitch the question back to you, Chris, um, if there is a preference or an urgency to the next Kobe assessment, um, please let us know what that is. And and at least for Bob and my part, and participating on the CDAR steering committee, we can uh, put a request in formally to get that up on the schedule for an out year. Thanks, Pat, uh, and um, Chris can chime in with you uh, offline if he needs to on that. Uh, Lynn Fegley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I had a similar question. Spot and Kroger, um, I should probably know the answer to this, but I was under the impression that those would go through um, another benchmark. And I'm just curious what that means in 2024, that it's a trigger date slash potential review. It, it, would, would they be doing a benchmark or what 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 are we doing there yeah the the trigger is just that it hasn't been um sort of formally scheduled yet um i believe you are correct that it's a benchmark though i can't remember if it is for both of them i'm trying to pull up last uh our last go around we had shifted them back um, to account for the bottleneck that was occurring in 2022, I believe it was. Um, give me a moment. I can try to pull that up, though. Sure. No, or if somebody, okay. uh, if one of the stock assessment scientists knows off the top of their head. Yeah, those are supposed, this is Kristen. Those are supposed to be benchmarks, Croker and Spot, in 2024. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, I don't see any other hands. Um, we have a proposed update to uh, the assessment schedule. Um, is there any opposition to the changes in the schedule? There is, if you could raise your hand. Mr. Chairman, before you ask for that, can I just ask one more clarification from Sarah? Um, Absolutely, go ahead. I apologize. The, I just want to make sure we have it right on the record. The slide says an update in 2024 for striped bass here. And I thought your other slide said benchmark for 2024 for striped bass. I just want to be clear what it is. Um, I believe update is correct. I don't know if the previous slide had the wrong information. Yeah, this is Katie. Um, yeah, it's update. 
yeah so i think the this the 2024 would be the five-year trigger for um striped bass but it has not been officially scheduled or added to the um workshop yet so uh or added to the sark schedule yet um so i think we have an update because we would be doing at least an update to support um the erp benchmark process as well as management but it hasn't been formally scheduled um, either way and i think that's something that the tc needs to weigh in on to figure out if we'll be ready for a benchmark or not uh, in 2024. thanks katie Great, thank you for that clarification. So um, back to the policy board, um, we have an updated assessment schedule in front of you. Uh, are there any objections uh, to the updated schedule? Seeing no hands going up, hearing nobody chiming in, then uh, we'll consider uh, the um, uh, assessment schedule updated by consensus. Thank you very much. And let's move right along with the reports and we'll go to the Habitat Committee, uh, Lisa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I'll wait for Maya to pull up my presentations. I'm going to start with the, um, the ACFIP one. Maya, next slide, please. The ACFIP Steering Committee met virtually June 29th to 30th. We discussed the progress made on the National Fish Habitat Conservation Through Partnerships Act, which was passed back in October of 2020. The steering committee also received an update on current on the ground projects, and I'll go into some of those um, in the next couple slides. I gave an update on the progress on our fundraising development strategy. The steering committee approved the 2021 Melissa Laser Fish Habitat Conservation Award recipient and hopefully um, we'll be able to present that award in October in New Jersey at the annual meeting, but um, of course we'll be keeping an eye on Delta as um, Mr. Chair already mentioned. And we welcome Restore America's Estuaries as the newest ACFIT partner. Next slide. For fiscal year 2021 National Fish Habitat funding, um, we received funding for three on-the-ground projects plus operational support for ACFIP, and the amount of funding was considered level three, which is the highest amount of funding available to a fish habitat partnership, and this is based on performance in previous years, so we're um, excited to be getting this level of funding. Next slide. The first project that we'll be funding for um, 2021 is titled Living with Water, USS Battleship North Carolina Habitat Restoration. And this is in the Cape Fear River, Wilmington, North Carolina. They'll be receiving $50,000 from NIPHAP funding and the total cost of the project is $3 million, led by Battleship North Carolina. And the goal is to connect hydrologic function and services to the Cape Fear River to restore 800 linear feet of intertidal shoreline and establish two acres of tidal wetland. Next slide. And here is an aerial view of the project site. Next slide. The second project that will be funded is Armstrong Dam removal on the Minotaquat River in Braintree, Massachusetts. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. They'll be receiving $50,000 of NIPAP funding. Total cost of the project is 3.34 million. This project is led by the town of Braintree and will restore 36 miles of upstream access for river herring and American eel. And it's part of a multi-burial removal um, project on the river. Next slide. And here is um, a picture of the Armstrong Dam as well, well as an aerial view of the project site. Next slide. And the third project that will be funded with NIPAP funding is ecological restoration of 39 salt marsh acres at Great Meadows Marsh. This is at the Stuart B. McKinney National Wildlife Refuge in Stratford, Connecticut. They'll be receiving $47,333 and the total cost of the project is 1.57 million. This is led by Audubon, Connecticut. And the, um, the goal is to remove invasive plants and dredged filled soils in order to restore marsh elevation to reconnect a pond to the tidal channel and remove two defunct culverts. Next slide. And here's an image of the degraded marsh as well as an aerial view. Or map. <laughs> Next slide. ACFIP also received funding from NOAA Recreational Fisheries um, through a grant called Increasing Recreational Fisheries Engagement through the Fish Habitat Partnerships. 
And um, this funding will go towards Bill Burton Pier in Cambridge, Maryland. Um, we received $65,968, and um, the funding will go towards to CCA Maryland in order to improve outreach, both in Spanish and English, about the 350 reef balls that are located under the pier. And the outreach will include a live camera, um, as well as reef ball building activities, a video about the project, and signage along the pier about the, the project and the, the species that it's benefiting. Next slide. And here is a map slash aerial view of um, where the live cams will be, as well as where the restoration site is. Next slide. ACFIP also endorsed four projects since the last time I provided an update. Two of these are proposals that are led by universities, and two of them are on the ground projects. Next slide. As far as the two on the ground projects, the first one is Carries Fort Estrine and Rockland Hammock Restoration on Key Largo. This project is led by Florida Department of Environmental Protection and Dagny Johnson Key Largo Hammock Botanical State Park, which is um, quite a mouthful. It will restore over two acres of mangrove, tidal flat, and Rockland Hammock. Next slide. And the second project endorsement is also in Florida. It's the Cape Sable Coastal Wetland Restoration Project in the Everglades, led by Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. And it will restore 50,000 acres of salt marsh, mangroves, and loose fine sediment. Next slide. ACFIP, um, as always, would like to thank ASMFC for your continued operational support. And I'm going to jump into the other um, the other updates, and then I'll be happy to take any questions at the end, if that's okay. So next up is the Habitat Committee report, and this one will be much uh, much more brief. Next slide. The Habitat Committee met virtually on June 24th, and they received updates on the documents in progress, acoustic impacts to fish and fish habitat as well as the Habitat Hotline. The topic of this year's Habitat Hotline will be coastal fish habitats as climate change buffers. Um, we also continued working on the fish habitats of concern, which is very close to, um, to going out to the technical committees for review. I'm happy to say, just have a couple species left to go on that one. And we had a discussion on dredge window um, elimination proposal in the um, US Army Corps of Engineers Savannah District. And the Habitat Committee has a draft letter in process. This letter is very similar to the letter that was sent by the Commission earlier this year to the Army Corps Wilmington District in regards to concerns around the um, Army Corps' proposal to eliminate dredging windows and how the elimination of those dredging windows will affect Commission managed species, as well as set precedent for other districts along the coast. But this letter to the Savannah District will also include additional information on protected species. The Habitat Committee is um, hoping to get right now from the Policy Board consensus to send the letter to the core. And staff has discussed with leadership to have the Commission Chair, Vice Chair, and Doug Hamans sign off on the letter in order to get this out in a timely fashion. So um, I might stop right here, Mr. Chair, if that's okay with you, and see if we can get consensus from the Policy Board to um, to just have the chair, vice chair, and um, Doug Hamans um, sign off on the letter once it's ready. Sure, thanks, Lisa. Um, the um, I, I did see a draft of the letter, uh, and I do know it's still a work in progress at this time. But does the um, policy board have any objections of uh, leadership working with Doug uh, to finalize this letter? I am seeing no hand, so I will take that as consensus of the policy board to uh, advance the letter to leadership uh, to be finalized. So with that, uh, you can continue on. Lisa. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, Maya, next slide, please. And finally, with the Habitat Committee, we have a couple of new members since the last update. Alexa Fournier from New York, David Dippold from Pennsylvania, and Randy Owen from um, Virginia. Next slide. And finally, um, the Artificial Reef Committee report, which I have just one slide to throw in here. Um, next slide. The Artificial Reef Committee released an update to the ASMFC profiles of state artificial reef programs and projects. And this um, original publication was from 19, 
88, and the update was released in July and highlights some of the accomplishments over the last 30 plus years. The policy board approved the language of this update, I believe, back in the winter. Um, the publication summarizes the number of permitted sites, mitigation reefs, and average annual budget along the coast. It has information for each state with an artificial reef program, and um, the publication is available on the ASMFC website. Next slide. And as always, um, the Habitat Committee and Artificial Reef Committee welcome any suggestions for action items that you would like to have us work on. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Lisa. Any questions um, for Lisa on any of these issues? Adam Nowalski. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that report. Uh, could you provide some further detail about the scope of the acoustic impacts work that you're doing and reporting out on through the Habitat Committee. Specifically, what I would be interested in knowing if any of that would be doing any research related to offshore energy development, wind in particular. Uh, we at the Mid-Atlantic Council have had some discussion uh, about concerns and potential impacts that have been reported with angler interactions with subacoustic bottom profiling, for example. Example. So I was wondering if the acoustic impacts work that you're doing right now would include something like that, uh, and if not, what the scope of it would be that might be relevant to wind development. Sure. So um, a lot of the acoustics draft right now is um, completed except for, I would say, the impacts to fish habitat section. So we have a lot of information right now ready to go on the introduction impacts to fish um, and we're still try, trying to compile the literature on how it might impact um, the, the habitat portion we are considering wind as part of that and i i would assume one of the recommendations would be to research more because as we saw earlier today you know there is we, there are impacts on the fish, but the, the studies are few and far between. So I think we're limited right now in terms of the literature and the case studies on this, but um, we, we do want to include wind in the report. So just one follow-up, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. So would you agree that impacts of subacoustic bottom profiling gear would be appropriate for inclusion in the report, at least as to whether or not you can find any literature that may be relevant to those impacts? Would I expect to see that in this report or would I not expect to see that in this? If if we can find the literature on subacoustic bottom profiling gear, and if you have any to send me, I'm happy to share that with those preparing the report. Um, I any literature that you have on that, I'm happy to review, and then the the habitat committee is happy to consider putting it into the report. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adam. Um, do we have any members of the policy board? Uh, that have any questions for Lisa. We do have one member of the public, uh, Mr. Fletcher. I'm going to. We're we're starting to run into some time constraints, so I'll give you uh, three minutes, please. The National Condi Coastal Conditions Report put out by EPA lists a number of chemicals man-made chemicals in all of the coastal waters. When will the habitat and stuff address the man-made chemicals and plastics in the coastal waters? Is that, will that ever be addressed by the Habitat Committee? Will water conditions be addressed by Habitat Committee? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fletcher. Uh, Lisa, do you have any comment on that? If, if that's of interest for the policy board or a specific management board for the Habitat Committee to take on and discuss, we're, we're very happy to do that. Um, water quality is definitely an issue and the water column is obviously a habitat for fish. So if that is something that the commission is concerned with, we are happy to take that on. 
Great. Thank you, Lisa. Um, before I switch, I'm going to give the policy board one more uh, bite at the apple here for any last questions before we go to the next item. Seeing no hands, uh, that concludes the committee reports. I want to thank Sarah and Lisa for those excellent reports. Um, the next item is review of non-compliance and uh, happy to report that we have no non-compliance findings at this time. So with that, we will move on to other business and I have uh, Adam Nowalski uh, regarding the uh, appeals process. Adam? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As I'm sure probably everyone's heard by now, uh, the Summer Flounder Scup and Black Sea Bass Management Board did complete its deliberations yesterday and working with the Mid-Atlantic Council. Uh, as a result of the appeal, New York was given a 1% increase to the baseline allocation. Uh, and let me just start off by thanking everybody that was involved uh, in that process. Uh, it was a lengthy meeting yesterday. Uh, thankfully, it didn't seem to impact the Menhaden board by us taking up too much time. So thanks again to everybody for their uh, working on that. So during the course of getting ready for that meeting, uh, there were two items relevant to the appeal that came to my attention that I wanted to bring before the policy board today. Uh, I've uh, passed these notes along to you already, Mr. Chairman, so you have seen them earlier today. Uh, the first one is that the appeals process, as it was last modified and approved back in 2019, uh, is essentially silent on what happens after the policy board uh, makes a directive to a species management board. Uh, what we're left with in the document right now is upon receipt of the policy board recommendation, the management board will discuss the findings and make the necessary changes. The management board is obligated to make changes that respond to the findings of the policy board. So specifically, uh, what's come up is the question of should a policy board or should a management board not be able to come to a uh, decision that is within uh, the findings of the policy board, what happens at that point, some possible scenarios that had been discussed between myself and staff was that the policy board may take ultimate action. Uh, what's also missing here is any type of timeline. Uh, there was some discussion that perhaps uh, a management board may benefit uh, from some work by a technical committee or a PDT potentially. Uh, so the timeline that would be required, I think the assumption was that the management board would take action at its next meeting, uh, but I think there might be some room for discussion. Uh, and I'm not saying that decision has to be made here today, but I just wanted to raise that issue of what happens uh, after the topic goes back to the management board, I think the appeals process is somewhat lacking in terms of detailing that. Uh, the other item to bring up, and this came up during the discussion yesterday, as well as uh, some management board members have brought it up uh, today, and I don't know if you want to entertain any input from some of them who may be on, uh, is there is concern about is there a potential precedent setting uh, by a policy board being drawn into an appeals process that results in a change to an allocation decision. Uh, there was talk about whether perhaps this might be appropriate to be bounced back to the allocation working group. Uh, there was talk about the management board itself possibly trying to dive deeper into this and discuss it. We did not have time yesterday, but possibly at a future meeting. Uh, but I certainly think it would be helpful uh, for the policy board to at least provide some direction to those that were interested in that concern about what you may be doing to address it. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to bring those issues forward. Thanks, Adam. Uh, I appreciate you bringing those forward. I think um, uh, on the first point, uh, well, let me let me back up. I did have a conversation uh, with our executive director around these particular issues. Um, I think we were both in agreement that uh, the appeal process, um, uh, as it pertained to black sea bass and the appeal from the state of New York, certainly the process worked. 
um, um, and and we carried it right out through to the very end with the with the result of uh, the one percent uh, change in the allocations as you suggested, Adam. So I think from from that standpoint, things work. Um, th this question of um, uh, what happens if the the species board did not act? Um, to me, the the natural thing would be that it would have to then go back to the policy board and be um, and, and be addressed. Um, and with that in mind, though, I think it's clear that the the document is silent on that. And um, what I would suggest um, is that staff takes a, a look at that document, um, uh, makes a makes potentially some corrected changes in a draft format and then brings it to the executive committee and then ultimately back to the policy board for uh, for a final vote on uh, any changes that are needed in that document. And then um, regarding the deliberations, I, I, I mean, I felt like we were really consistent with the issue at hand yesterday um, with the policy boards, uh, with leaderships, both leaderships finding that the appeal was was warranted and the fact that the policy board then stayed very focused um, on that one particular issue and, and tried not to broaden it. I think the fact that we didn't broaden it has raised some level of criticism. I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with it, but uh, I'm, I am just one of uh, many of us. So um, I would be happy to entertain a few comments around the particular issues that, uh, that Adam has raised uh, at this time. Um, and um, maybe if we, if there is agreement by the policy board that uh, we have staff take a look at this and bring it back up through, we'll use the executive committee again as a as kind of a work group uh, on this matter, and then we can bring it back to the policy board for for any final uh, adoptions if that's the case. Um, I'm going to go back to the policy board at this time. I've got one hand up, Pat Gear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Nowalski for bringing this up. Um, I don't sit on the Summer Flounder, Black Sea Bass, and Scub Board, but I was listening in, and you know the entire Virginia delegation from both the council and the commission expressed concerns about this. So we would greatly appreciate you know the executive board looking into this and exploring it further. And I just want to again thank you, thank you for the consideration on this, and hopefully you know we can straighten this out so we don't have the problem moving forward in the future. Great, thanks for that comment, Pat. Uh, John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm I'm glad these uh, points came up. I think the process was uh, depends on your perspective. I don't think it worked very well, mainly because I think the policy board, what they sent back to the uh, management board, were options that were not in the addendum. And I know we're not as restricted as we are, like you know, in, in a regulatory process where you have to follow the Administrative Procedures Act. I know every state has one, uh, federal government has one. But at the same time, we ended up being told to do an option that wasn't even in the plan or that went out to the public for, uh, for comment. And, you know, in those cases, I think we need to be a little more careful with the policy board that if they are going to remand something back to the uh, management board, that they need to remain something that is based on what went out to the public and was seen by the public. I mean, this came as a rebuke, in my estimation, to the states that had voted legitimately for the options that went into what was then the approved Addendum 33. And then to have it come back, you know, I get it with the appeal, fine. But to be told to then, uh, cobbled together some options that weren't even in the uh, addendum that went out to the public, I think that's something else we have to look at. I mean, if if there is going to be a remand, I think it has to be something that is in the actual uh, addendum that goes out for public comment. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, I, I believe some of that was in the document that went out uh, and was discussed at the board meeting back in February, but uh, not to debate the point. Um, you know the the level of flexibility. Yeah, Pat, I don't want to debate it. I'm just saying that you know you kind of have to look at the uh, the draft addendum cross side and sideways to come up with that option. I mean, it really was not a uh, straight up option that was 
reviewed by the public. I mean, I know we often do things that are between two options when it is in a single option, as we did with Connecticut. You know, instead of 5%, they were given 2%. But this was really cobbled together from several different options there, and that was never discussed in the draft addendum that the public saw. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. But, you know, again, if this happens again, let's just be a little more careful. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, Pat, I see your hand is back up. Was it left up or do you have another comment? I apologize, sir. No, no, no need to apologize. Thank you. Um, any other questions uh, or comments from the policy board? I'm, I'm not seeing any additional hands. I do want to thank Adam for bringing this particular issue up. I mean, we, we it's similar to the conservation equivalency conversations that were had at the executive committee. We've got we have a policy document on this. These policy documents are uh, are meant to be adaptive and meant to change as we come up with or run into issues um, that hadn't been thought of, uh, right? I mean, and, and this is the case here. Um, so uh, with no objection, we'll have staff go back, review the document, review the comments here today, and then bring uh, any potential changes to the executive committee for further discussion uh, use the executive committee, I said, as I said, as a work group, and then we'll advance it back to the policy board uh, for the October meeting. Uh, any objections to that approach? Seeing no hands and hearing no objections, then we'll move forward in that direction. Um, that concludes our business of the ISFMP policy board, uh, unless there is any additional items that people would like to bring up on their other business. Seeing no hands, the um, uh, I will um, uh, adjourn the policy board meeting at this time. Um, the business session is scheduled to begin at 2.45, and let's just stick with that schedule. We've all been here sitting in our chairs for quite some time. We'll take a 15-minute break, and then we'll uh, come back at 2.45, where we've got some quick business to deal with. Well, thank you very much for your time on this particular item, and we'll talk to you in about 15 minutes. Thank you.